In this interview, we talk about optimizing images in real time and speeding up page loads. Before we dive into this episode, I've got a deal for you from Linux Academy. Linux Academy offers high quality training for teams and individuals on topics like Amazon Web Services, DevOps, Linux, and OpenStack. In addition to video content, they also have scenario-based labs where you complete tasks on live servers. Go to scalyourcode.com slash Linux Academy for a 24% discount. That's scalyourcode.com slash Linux Academy. Hey fellow developers, my name is Christoph Limpelaire and you're tuning in to the Scale Your Code show. This is a show where we talk about making web apps faster and able to grow with traffic. Now when it comes to making web pages load quickly, images can be quite problematic. They're heavy and without the right optimizations, they can take seconds to load. The other problem with images is making them responsive on every device. Turns out there's a service out there called Imagex that does all of this for you. And Kelly Sutton is the chief product officer, so I've asked this, asked him to join us on the show to explain how it works and to give us some actionable, actionable items that we can apply to our own images. Kelly, welcome to Scale Your Code. Thanks for having me, Christoph. Yeah, thanks for your time. I'm pretty excited for this interview, and here's why. Really, how many websites don't use images, right? We've got blogs, we've got services, we've got product pages. Images are used to give some kind of meaning to the page, right? Mm -hmm. But the problem is, like I said in the intro, is sometimes they're too heavy, they can take too long to load, and it's bad user experience. They're sitting there waiting, just seeing a blank screen. And so we want to avoid that as much as possible. That's what you guys do at Imagex, and I'll ask you in just a minute to give us some use cases, examples of what problems you guys solve. But first mm -hmm. of all, Kelly, I want to get to know you a little bit better. Now, sure. you're the chief product officer, right? What does yep. that mean? What do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, so daily, my responsibilities will change quite a bit. Um, it's turning into, I guess, more and more management. I was the 10th or 11th employee, and now we're up to 20. So as as the team grows, uh, my responsibilities go from being uh, kind of just being a, like an individual contributor, moving into more uh, management. Uh, and so I, I manage the product and, and everything that it touches. Uh, for a service like Imagex, uh, data is a very important thing to us, um, and making sure that uh, the data of how our users and how our customers are using the product informs future product decisions. Um, and then deciding what those what those what those product decisions are going to be, and then kind of scheduling them and deciding when when they'll get built. And I've seen you on GitHub as well, resolving some issues where you have different SDKs for different languages that people want to plug into their application. But of course, that usually result or results in wanting more features or having some issues that were not expected. And mm -hmm. so I've seen you going on there and helping some people out or helping resolve some problems with uh, with bugs and stuff like that as well. Yeah, so so as as ImageX has been growing, it's it's been uh, I've been I guess jumping on a grenade and uh, <laughs> and getting getting things better, and then uh, uh, hiring into those things that we want to get better at. So we actually just hired someone to basically manage our open source libraries and mm -hmm. do a few other things full time, uh, just because that is a very important part of what we do. Like ImageX is only as useful uh, as it is easy to integrate, so it's very important for us to be extremely easy to integrate. That can make or break an, an entire product if you don't have the support there. People can't get it to work with the applications. They're going to let go of it and find and go to the nearest competitor. So, yeah, very good point. Yeah. So can you give us some actual examples of what people could use Imagex for before mm -hmm. we start talking about the architecture behind it? Yeah, sure. So Imagex is a real-time image uh, processing solution. Uh, technically, uh, it, is like a, it, it is an image proxy. Um, so it can resize, process, add filters, change formats of images in real time just by changing the URL parameters. Um, we like to call it the graphics card for the internet. Uh, this the company itself was kind of born out of a pain of of our co-founder and CEO, or our founder and CEO, I should say, uh, Chris, while he was at YouTube. He noticed YouTube was having a hell of a time 
dealing with all of their thumbnails, and he, and he rightly assumed that this is a problem that a lot of other people would have as well. Um, and this is also a problem that's getting worse, not better. If you want to not serve the same image to every single client, like you probably should not be serving the same uh, image to a web browser uh, and that same image down to a phone. Uh, you should really be serving them different sizes, different pixel densities, so on and so forth. Why? Um, well, because any uh, the assumption there is is any unoptimized image is adding uh, load time to the page. And for our customers, especially the ones uh, that operate in e-commerce uh, and kind of content media, as we call it, uh, that is actually hurting uh, hurting your business every second. Uh, of extra load time usually decreases conversion rates by about seven percent. Mm -hmm. wow. So if you're not if you're not paying attention to this stuff, uh, it's probably hurting you more than you even know. Mm -hmm. um, and this is also a problem that's getting worse, not better. Right? Like 10, 15 years ago, uh, you just kind of had the desktop to worry about with like old CRT monitors, and you had Firefox and IE, and you had JPEGs and Pings, and that's it. Now you have, I mean, I don't know how many different phones, <laughs> multiple different pixel densities multiple different device sizes. Now you have watches, you have uh, no shortage, or no less than like five formats that you can deliver for the best experience. Uh, and then you also have people in, in very constrained con uh, connections on like in mobile environments as well. Mm -hmm. So so really, ImageX is there for both cosmetic reasons where you can modify the image, the colors of it, uh, that kind of thing, but also for performance reasons where you're serving the, uh, the right size image, the right pixel density image for the mm -hmm. device itself. And even cost reasons. So, like the funny, uh, the funny thing about this is, if you start doing this correctly, you start serving like only the pixels needed for that device. You're probably mm -hmm. serving fewer pixels, uh, and those images will images will be uh, less data. So your CDN bills will actually decrease as you do mm -hmm. that as well. So. So when I first ran across the company, the reason I was really interested in doing this interview, or another reason I was, is because just. Just doing this on my own computer, right? I've got images mm -hmm. I want to put on Scalar Code or any other application. I want yep. to optimize them by hand. It's a time-intensive process. But with ImageX, you're doing it sometimes in real time, and we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail. This is something that's extremely resource-intensive. Just yep. doing a few images on my computer takes some time. It takes mm -hmm. maybe a few seconds. So doing this on the fly and in real time is incredible. But at the same time, I want to... I want to learn and teach other people how to do this, even if they don't want to use ImageX. Mm -hmm. I want them to understand what optimizations are right for their images and how they can do it themselves on their own computers to have faster websites. Yep. Um, so, you know, just so people are aware of what we're going to be diving into here. Uh, what kind of scale are you running out? Uh, running uh, at? So we are just shy of 1 billion images served per day. 1 um, billion so images per day. Yeah, so that's that's kind of the the top line number that we that we like to keep track of and, and tell people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other numbers that you keep a close eye on, or is that really the main one? Uh, revenue, revenue is very important to us. Sure. We're one of these uh, one of these startups which is doing uh, this very novel thing that you don't see a whole lot, which is known as uh, making money um, <laughs> and charging for the product. What's that? I don't <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so, so that's very important to, for us in, in keeping track of uh, uh, making sure that ImageX uh, uh, is a healthy business as it grows, and we're not just simply subsidizing uh, a uh, like bandwidth costs or image processing costs for our customers. It's very important to us that ImageX stays around a while. Uh, and you can only do that if your business is healthy. Otherwise, you're uh, kind of just basically raising, raising money to mm -hmm. give it to your vendors otherwise. When did ImageX start? Uh, ImageX was started in 2010 by our CEO, uh, Chris Zacharias. Okay, so five, five years ago, and now you're up to 20 employees and still growing. So Yep. Interesting. Yep. What, uh, what does your architecture look like? You've got load balancers, web servers, what's going on there? Yeah, so our architecture looks, is, is very unique, right? So we, uh, uh, we kind of have a, a clean split between the web application layer, so that's, that'll handle things like serving out the website, uh, 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 serving out the uh, web dashboard, as we call it, so if you're administering your account, uh, making changes, adding C names, so on and so forth. Um, uh, that is a very, very small part of what we do. The big part of what we do is, is serving as an image proxy. Mm -hmm. um, 
So we need to design, it's, the entire thing is designed to sit in between uh, the origin layer and the CDN layer uh, and process these images in real time. Um, we famously use, I guess, Max to do all of the graphics, uh, graphics processing, and we can get into that and why we use Max in a bit. Um, we also run our own hardware, which is pretty rare these days. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a data center down in Santa Clara okay. um, full of Macs. <laughs> um, and, and the stack, we, we have uh, uh, a few very cleanly split layers as you go down and as, as requests uh, go through and then come back to the end users. Uh, the open source, uh, uh, open source projects that we like quite a bit are HAProxy. Uh, we use Heka for some uh, logging stuff, which is a Go-based uh, log aggregator, um, and then a, a handful of other stuff. But there is also a decent amount of uh, custom-built code. Like all of the graphics processing stuff is in C, Objective C, mm. and uh, Lua of all languages. Okay. Um, and the reason for that is. Those when you're doing uh, as many images as we are a day, uh, and you want to get the most out of this hardware that you've purchased, you really need to make sure that you're doing that uh, very quickly uh, and in the smartest way as possible. And you usually need access to all of the all of the things that those low le low level languages will give you. You guys wrote up a blog post that explains the implementation of the Mac servers, and it has mm -hmm. uh, really beautiful pictures of the data center as well. I'll link that below and. Uh, with your permission, I'll try to add some of those images as well. Uh, but you said uh, that you have the origin, which is where mm -hmm. all the processing is going on, and then you've got mm -hmm. the CDN in front of that. What uh, what kind of, of CDNs do you use to, to serve the images? Yeah, sure. So the, the origin is actually where the images live. Uh, and so we're unique in that we don't require you to give us your images. You can just leave them on S3, you can leave them on Google Cloud Storage, or even just any publicly accessible, fully qualified URL. You can just proxy that through us. Um, and then for uh, delivery, uh, we don't actually, uh, we're not in the CDN business, we're just in the image processing business. So for delivery, we'll, we'll work with, uh, we can work with any CDN, but by default, we work with uh, Fastly. Okay, so you're not actually storing any of the images on your origin. Those are stored in whatever person is using, like S3, for example. You're just proxying through it. Yep. All right, so and we, and we, have, we have like layers of cache to make sure that we don't have to go back to origin. Um, uh, if we don't need to, uh, so we'll respect things like the cache control headers to make sure if if you've if a if a single object or a single resource has a long life or you've set you've set it to have a long TTL, mm -hmm. uh, we will make a best effort to not refetch that, thereby incurring uh, like an S3 cost on you. Okay, but what do you mean by different layers of of CDN? Why do you need different layers? Or different different layers of caching. So you can imagine, yes, uh, yeah. So we have something called a an origin cache. Um, so when you make uh, when you make a request for an image on Imagix, you can imagine the web browser over here. Uh, it hits uh, what's known as a CDN edge node, which is uh, something very close to where you're located or as close to where you're located as possible. Uh, that request will then travel to our Santa Clara data center, uh, and then our Santa Clara data center will say, "Okay, do I have uh, uh, do I have this image? Um, yes or no? If no, I need to reprocess it." And so it'll go to, or if no, I need to process it. Um, if it needs to process it, it will uh, make sure it has it locally. If it doesn't have it locally, it'll go back to Amazon S3, which is usually where the image lives. Pull that file into the data center, put it in our cache in the data center, do the processing, and then send it up to the edge node. Um, I should also note that if the if the file already exists on the CDN edge node, um, we don't. Uh, it never. Even, the request never even makes it back to our data center. Okay, um, what does this look like on the actual page itself? Like, how do you tell mm -hmm. ImageX, hey, I want you to process this image? Yeah, uh, so the good thing is, is that you don't, uh, you can't always tell, right? So uh, one of the best giveaways, though, is to see if uh, the ImageX, or see if the image URL, like the source attribute, is ends in ImageX.net, or the host name ends in ImageX.net. Um, but a lot of our customers use uh, C names uh, with their own SSL certificates, uh, so that it just is like images dot uh, uh, customer name dot com, for example. Okay, and yeah. in the actual HTML itself, are you just changing the image tag and saying, "Hey, uh, image source equals" and passing in that URL? Is that how it works? 
Uh, so all all image transformations are specified by the URL parameters. So basically, you would add like uh, if you wanted to resize something to be eight hundred by six hundred, you'd uh, at the end of the uh, URL you'd add some parameters. So question mark w equals eight hundred and uh, ampersand uh, h equals six hundred, uh, and then okay. we'll give you back a, an eight hundred by six hundred image. And so then that will go, like you were just saying earlier, that will go mm -hmm. through the different caching layers and check yep. and see if there is one there. If not, then you're going to process the image depending on those URL mm -hmm. parameters and give that yep. back to the user um, that's waiting for the image to load. Okay. Yep. And so exactly. this, the, the cost saving there is that you're loading an image that's more optimized for the particular browser or particular device, mm -hmm. instead of just specifying media queries in CSS or something like that, you're, you're actually serving the right dimension image. Okay, that makes yep. sense. Yep, and then you as a user, you only have to worry about uh, keeping around your master images and you don't have to worry about keeping around all of the der derivatives. You kind of just, our customers just trust us with those and trust us to generate those on the fly. Um, okay, and that's that's the incredible part. You're able to to do these on the fly or to process mm -hmm. these on the fly, but still have it be faster than uh, or more cost optimization or optimized than if you were doing it this way. That's that's really incredible. How does that work? How are you able to do this? <laughs> What's the magic sauce? Uh, uh, be I mean, you like you got to think of like every single like the average cold request time, uh, like traversing that entire stack yeah. that I mentioned. Uh, is 700 milliseconds, so that's process that's fetching and processing an image, which we usually don't need to do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we usually need to do that like once, uh, and then so for every layer that or for every step that you don't have to do, the image is going to come back even faster. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, and so then the so first some, time is just the slowest one, and then after that, it gets faster and faster. Yeah, and and the first time it's not it's not even that slow, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean. We we are always looking for ways to make it faster uh, than 700 milliseconds, but sometimes the, or traditionally the weakest link in the chain has actually been the connection between our data center uh, and the origin, just because sometimes uh, whatever whatever is the origin, uh, if it's just a web server, uh, it's not always configured to serve, serve those files back as fast as possible. How um, do you get that down to 700 milliseconds? Well, it's taken us five years. Um, <laughs> and you also... Uh, and because we run our own hardware, we have we have access to uh, really optimize every single thing, and we don't have to deal with any sort of noisy neighbor problems or any uh, um, request scheduling issues that you might see in a in a shared tenant solution. Uh, like if you were to build this on AWS, not mo not only would it be a lot more expensive, uh, it would also uh, be much slower. Mm -hmm. I want to tell you more about what my sponsor, Linux Academy, offers and why it's such a great deal for you. By going to scalarco.com slash linuxacademy, you get access to almost 2,000 videos on topics like AWS, DevOps, Linux, and OpenStack. Linux Academy is a training company, so in addition to video content, they have hands-on training labs where you connect to real servers. All of this for a discounted rate of $22 a month. $22 for unlimited access to everything I just told you. Get your account at scalyourcode.com slash linuxacademy. That's scalyourcode.com slash linuxacademy. Happy learning, my friends. What kinds of processing do you guys perform on these servers? Mm -hmm. Is it just running the image through some kind of uh, just black box processing, or do you have specific things going on? Sorry. Um, so we have a uh, we have eighty three, eighty four different URL parameters uh, that you can append to every image request. Uh, the most common ones are pretty simple things uh, like uh, changing the height and width and cropping of an image. Uh, all of all of the operations are essentially constant time operations and uh, infinitely composable. So we have a set uh, we have an order of operations implied. So we'll uh, we'll like resize an image before doing uh, before changing its format, for example. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, you can mix and mix and match those uh, URL parameters as much as you want, and they're as simple as resizing, like I mentioned, to actually changing the 
uh, output format of the image to best serve the browser, right? Mm -hmm. So in many situations, uh, WebP is the best uh, image type to serve down to a Chrome browser, but only Chrome supports it. Mm -hmm. So unless you build that into your own image processing solution or your own CDN, uh, you're, uh, you're probably actually serving images that are too large to your users that are using Chrome, and Chrome's right. a, Chrome has a pretty big market share these days. So uh, mm -hmm. just by like turning that switch on, you can, you can shave off a bunch of uh, your CDN bill. Why Apple servers? Is it really better hardware for this kind of processing or better hardware combined with better software? Why was it? Or what was it that made you decide to go with Apple servers? Uh, uh, it's it's def like the better hardware and better software actually plays into it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, we use Core Image a lot in our stack, uh, but uh, also and uh, uh, you you wouldn't guess it, but it's actually the most affordable way to do image processing at the scale that we're at. Um, per dollar, we can do more images uh, at a, actually a higher quality uh, than you could using uh, any sort of Linux based mm -hmm. uh, system. Yeah, interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could go because basically, basically, the assumption there is if if you're doing this on Linux, you're probably using uh, Image Magic, which is uh, <laughs> uh, it it can get the job done, but almost every single company will outgrow that. Uh, and so, unless you're unless you have a team of like image engineers, imaging engineers who are building uh, like a graphics pipeline that is custom to your business, uh, right right in the middle there, like where you've outgrown Image Magic, but you're not so big that you can put ten engineers mm -hmm. on building your own image processing software. Um, that's that's where Imagex lives. What if you're not in that category and you're a smaller business? You don't have the extra engineering manpower, but you're also not willing or interested in using a service like Imagex. What kinds of processing would you recommend that people can do to really optimize their images as much as possible? Mm -hmm. Uh, so the best thing you can do for your images, if you're looking to optimize them uh, for your website to get uh, get the page weight down, is definitely to uh, resize them. Uh, just like just the simple act of making sure if you have a container that's 800 pixels wide on your page or app, you're only serving an image that is 800 pixels wide and not like 2,000 pixels wide. Mm -hmm. uh, just because the relationship between like linear dimensions like that. Uh, uh, and the number of pixels is is a uh, quadratic, so you don't want to okay. like. There's actually a lot more data in even just getting getting a little bit bigger there and getting that wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, second thing is to make sure you're using a CDN. Um, in a very weird way, like and Ilya Gregoric has written about this a lot. I think uh, your previous guest uh, mentions like specifically the issue that latency has on the user experience, and it's. Bandwidth is not the important thing necessarily yeah. anymore. It's more latency. It's like it's like what is the time to first byte? What is um, uh, how how quickly? And, and then it's I guess it's a matter of bandwidth after that. But um, those those two things are like the the two easy things, and those are also two things that we do very well. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I will say this: one of the ways that I do it, and I'm, of course I'm not sure this is the the absolute best way, uh, but uh, usually when I have an image you can open it in Photoshop and yep. you can save for web and yep. then there's the option to change the quality and you can yep. see exactly on screen uh, how pixelated it becomes. Frankly, usually I, I stick to the range of like between medium and high quality and it's still, you can't really see a huge difference between that and the very high or maximum quality. Yep. But like you said, if you change the image size or if you crop it, it makes a drastic difference. You can go yep. from megabytes to just a few hundred kilobytes. So if, yep. if you're not already do, doing this, I highly recommend it. It's uh, Photoshop, for example, is one of them where you can go save, save as, or save for web. And mm -hmm. then the second thing that I'd recommend is there are, there's software out there that you can drag and drop into it, and it, you run optimizations, and it'll compress it. It'll strip some information that's not needed to really slim it down. Or there's also, you can use something like Gulp. Gulp yep. has uh, packages that you can run and optimize images through. That makes a huge difference. And then, of course, I use uh, CloudFront and yep. S3. In S3, I'll set a cache control header so that once the user loads it one time, they don't go back to it. Their browser has a cache of it. And then, of course, CloudFront, the CDN, like you said, to reduce that, that latency. So that would be my, my recommendation. And that's how I do it. Yeah, and like uh, in a lot of ways, safer safer web is a is is great, right? Like it it does exactly what you need to do. 
Um, and yeah, and then there are things like Tiny Ping and uh, Tiny Tiny JPEG, right? They'll kind of strip out metadata and do uh, uh, do some compression on it to really cut down the file size. Those are great. Um, and the reason why, and, and a lot of our, our customers that come to us are doing that, but then in, you can't do that when uh, you have like hundreds of thousands of users giving you like their profile photos, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or like hundreds of thousands <laughs> of, of people trying to start like Kickstarter campaigns, right? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Good luck there, with that. There, there become, yeah, there becomes a point where you're like, oh, we could hire like a hundred like <laughs> production designers to like crop all this stuff, or we could <laughs> <By> just hand, <laughs> outsource could it. Just basically, change this host name and add some URL parameters, and that would solve it. Yeah. Huh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Good point. Yeah, I'm but, not I mean, at that you, point yet, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You should always, you should always like, yeah, look, use use what works for you, right? Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. and then. On, on the imaging side, like we'll be there for when you when you outgrow it. Yeah. And hopefully, if they do have that many people giving them images, they also have enough money to be able to to pay. So, uh, yeah, that, that won't be as much of an issue. Yeah. So my next section was actually going to be how ImageX serves images, but I think yeah. we've covered that pretty well, apart from maybe uh, the part where you were saying that one of the biggest problems is the latency between your data center and. Um, was it the the CDN itself or people or uh, uh, between our data center and, and the and the origin? So where the, the where the master master images live? Yeah. How do you guys have any plans uh, to put in action to reduce that, or are you still working on it? Yeah. So it's a it's there. Are, I guess there are just like everything. There's a technical and human uh, components to the solution, right? There are technical uh, uh, technical solutions are improving our own origin cache, so the thing that pulls from origin and brings it into our data center, making sure that it only needs to fetch uh, fetch the uh, master resources uh, uh, as little as possible, okay. uh, so that we're just basically uh, uh, machines are just asking their neighbor yeah. uh, for that and not going across the country. Uh, human components for that are just are really around education, uh, really around documentation. Um, uh, geography has a big, uh, a, uh, a big, uh, a big component to it as well. So basically, the the education part is just telling our customers, uh, ImageX will perform a lot better if the origin is closer to us. Mm -hmm. um, if that is something you're able to do, you will see better initial fetch times. Um, and what that basically means is setting your Amazon S3 bucket to be uh, Northern California and not defaulting to Virginia. Uh, which also has another benefit there, which is the default S3 bucket uh, does not have what's known as read-on-write consistency. So you can give S3 a file and ask for it back immediately, uh, and you will Amazon S3 will sometimes tell you, "I don't have that file. I don't know anything about it," um, hmm. uh, which is problematic if you yeah. if your users upload a file and then you want to display that right away, but display it through ImageX. Uh, ImageX will ask S3, uh, "Hey." Give me this file, and S3 says, "I don't know. I've never seen that before, or I, I don't have that object, right?" Um, but all other S3 bucket or all other S3 regions don't have that issue. They do have oh. what's known as read-on-write consistency. Okay, yeah. I see. Interesting. So, what? a lot of lot of education, a lot of a uh, lot of documentation around that stuff. Yeah. Right. What other main t technical challenges do you guys have right now? Uh, we don't have. Many, uh, or I should say, we've built in enough capacity, and we've kind of hit uh, the plateau of like the step function that you often have to deal with with scaling. Uh, so right now, we're actually in more of a uh, cleaning things up for the next mm -hmm. big push, um, and and ne and next big, uh, 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 yeah, like ne next big uh, pieces of growth. Just just given the nature of our business, we have to build in a certain. Uh, overheads to capacity so that you know if one of our customers does run a flash sale or mm -hmm. gets a huge spike in traffic they don't have to worry about it um, uh, so there there we do keep quite a bit of headroom uh, mm -hmm. in there so we don't have too many technical uh, uh, technical scaling issues it's more just optimization issues it's like okay can we can our origin cache be better at uh, uh, at uh, you know, ev ev evicting content. Um, uh, maybe we can, you know, shave a few milliseconds or tens of milliseconds mm -hmm. off of off of uh, uh, transit, like within the data center. Oh, that's a bad example, but uh, uh, it's you know the the system is set up. Customers are using it, 
and then and every piece of the system is measured. So then now we can kind of slice things out and say like, okay, this is this is a bottleneck. Let's let's focus on that, and and then we move on to like the next bottleneck um, as as we go, right? How do you find those bottlenecks? How, what kind of monitoring tools do you use to track that latency and ways of uh, reducing it? Yeah, so uh, it's multi-full, or it, there are you know several different systems in place. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll use Prometheus for a lot of uh, uh, like heartbeat information and uh, just measuring the data right there. I don't deal too much with that system, so I can't okay. I can't uh, speak too in depth about that, um, but. Uh, the systems that we do have are able to measure uh, every single piece of uh, every single step of the chain, mm -hmm. uh, and then report that out. So we use um, a mix of a uh, hosted graphite and Riemann, Riemann I believe, rickshaw, Riemann. yeah, mm -hmm. uh, for displaying that data on some dashboards in the office. So you can, you know, we can see like oh that that piece of um, uh, or or some anomalous traffic triggered. A, a spike in specifically this piece of of our infrastructure, mm -hmm. uh, we should you know tag tag that peak, um, make sure that uh, and then make sure that we uh, uh, harden ourselves against that type of behavior in the future as well. If you're interested in learning more about Riemann, I interviewed James Turnbull a few episodes back where he does talk about uh, using Riemann in the interview, so that could be a good one for you to check out. And also, this kind of reminds me of the Basecamp interview I had with uh, David Heinemeier Hansen a few weeks back where they've actually built their own tooling system to be able to see, for example, what... Uh, uh, what service is slowing down, why a request was slow, maybe a MySQL request was a little bit too slow, and seeing every part of the application that it touched, every part of the hardware that it touched, and that way you can know exactly where that bottleneck is and pinpoint it and get rid of it, find ways to, to get rid of it as well. So sounds yeah. pretty similar to what you just described there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, some of the some of the off-the-shelf the, off solutions don't work that well for us, but whenever I'm doing like Rails work, um, on my free time, I really like to use uh, Skylight. It uh, gives Skylight. you kind of like like that very, very fine-grained, like this method call took mm -hmm. this many milliseconds or microseconds type of thing. Yeah, that's, that's really, really nice to have that kind of detail yeah. coming back to you. Yeah, exactly. So earlier we were talking about how we could use URL parameters, like say with 800 height, 400 pixels, mm -hmm. but you also have a JavaScript library that can auto-detect this called mm -hmm. auto-responsive images. Can you explain how that works? Uh, sure. So we have, uh, we have a JavaScript library called ImageX.js, which is a uh, client-side or browser uh, library that you can just include on your page. Uh, and then that will basically make sure all of your images are sized to their containers correctly, uh, especially, as, uh, especially if the window resizes, for example, uh, or if you drag your window, uh, drag your screen or sorry, drag the browser window on from a like a one x display to a two x display, uh, or if you load uh, uh, load this on a phone or wh whatever might cause the viewport uh, size and pixel density to change, uh, it'll detect all of that, and then it can also do a, a bunch of other stuff on top of that. And we like to kind of think of uh, ImageXJS as as kind of the the way the the level of control that we that we wish browsers built into. Uh, what you can do with images, uh, and actually we saw something just land uh, last month called Client Hints, which is kind of a step in that direction. Um, uh, client Hints, if do you know what Client Hints are? I've read about it, but I can't remember mm -hmm. off the top of my head. Can you tell so, us? Yeah, so it's a it's a I would say it's a it's a big deal. Again, uh, like all things web performance, it kind of traces back to Ilya Grigoric. Um, <laughs> Uh, basically, the brow uh, well, one browser right now, uh, Chrome, if you tell it to, will include extra information in the request headers for images, specifically the device pixel ratio of of uh, of the client. So, like one x, two x, three x, and then the width of the container, if that's available and able to be computed at that time, and then the width of the viewport. Uh, so, what this allows you to do, uh, if you're someone like ImageX, is say. Hey, the client, you know, the user included these URL parameters, but the client is actually telling me uh, mm -hmm. information that is slightly more specific. Mm -hmm. So if you have your ImageX, if ImageX, if your ImageX source is configured correctly, we will give client hence precedence uh, over the URL mm -hmm. parameters. So although you might have said like, hey, serve an 800 pixel wide image, we'll, be, we'll actually say, well, they asked for 800, but the browser is telling us 600, so we're going to go with 600. That uh, is really nice. Yeah, 
And so I'm kind of guessing here because I haven't looked at that library, but I'm guessing that your imagex.js, it just checks the width and height of that container mm -hmm. uh, as it changes. It's got a listener or something like that on that container itself. And that's how I can know, hey, this is the, the size of uh, image that we need, right? Is that pretty much how it works? Yeah, yeah. And to take advantage of client hands functionality, you, don't, you actually don't need imagex.js. Um, uh, you just need to change the URLs a little bit. Um, okay. Uh, but yeah, ImageXJS is still able to do all of that stuff and and more. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got a note. I'm looking at my notes here. I've got a question that says, "What is automatic content negotiation?" Yeah, I should have put more detail. I'm actually not. I forget what it is. So, what is automatic content <laughs> negotiation? Is that kind of what we were just talking about here? Yeah. So, automatic content negotiation is negotiation is similar, but it's okay. for file formats. So. Um, if you if you tell ImageX to, we will serve uh, serve the correct file format down to the browser, um, or or sorry, the the best image format down to the browser. So most images on the web are JPEG and PNG. Uh, both of those file formats are pretty old, uh, and they and there have been many advances in compression technology since then. So usually by just switching to WebP. Uh, you'll shave off like 40% of the file size there without any notice, noticeable losses in quality. Hmm. Uh, the problem there is that Chrome is the only browser that of course. Uh, will serve WebP, right? Um, and then actually every browser kind of has a more modern format that only they support. So with uh, Safari, it's like JPEG 2000 with uh, Microsoft IE, I think 10 and above, and then also Edge, uh, that is uh, what's known as JPEG XR. Um, so if you, if you tell us to, ImageX will make that decision for you, and it will automatically negotiate what content to send. Mm -hmm. um, and so content of that in that regard refers to the content type of, of the response. I've got my gears running here, just thinking about how to implement this. Let's say if I had some kind of JavaScript library or something mm -hmm. where you can detect, hey, this is Chrome, let's mm -hmm. serve this format, or this is this browser, let's serve this yeah. format. Of course, that adds a lot of complexity, but hey, if, if it's really lighter weight and without any noticeable change in the quality, then mm -hmm. that could be worth it for, for certain companies. Yeah, so you can do you can do that in uh, JavaScript for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem there is you'll have to wait for the JavaScript to start executing before you can begin those image requests, uh, right? right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and so if you just add the uh, URL parameter auto equals format uh, to the end of an imageX URL, we'll we'll handle it all uh, mm -hmm. all for you. Um, and like you, you would actually be surprised how how long uh, it takes for JavaScript to like swap in the right the right source attributes on image tags, just because the like browsers are very very sophisticated pieces of technology these days, and they'll often do things like pre-flight image requests before they're uh, sometimes even done uh, downloading uh, the entirety of the HTML for the web page, right? Mm -hmm. um, so they're they're very very sophisticated. So it's already loading that image, and then JavaScript's like, actually, this is the wrong image. Let's load the other one. So that's like, is that really a performance boost? Probably not, if that's the case, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, and and these are all these are all things that you'll need to measure and and right, uh, sure. uh, keep in mind depending on your your scenario. But usually, uh, if you if you can, you want to bake in uh, bake in the image you want to serve into the source attribute or the source set attribute. Mm -hmm. um, into the image tag since the browser will start fetching that much sooner. I've got a similar problem, except it's not as bad as with images since it's audio mm -hmm. files. I've got an MP3 player. Well, I say MP3 player, it can play mm -hmm. any different format, yeah. uh, which is what's nice because there's the OGG or OGG format, which is much lighter in weight. And mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, the quality is actually maybe a, a little bit better than just regular MP3. Again, the problem yeah. is I think only <laughs> Chrome can load OGG. Everything yep. else needs MP3. And so uh, thankfully, the J player I'm using can detect that change, yep. except unlike with images, it's fine if there's a delay. It's fine if it has or it has time to calculate that difference because yep. people aren't going to automatically click the play button. If yeah, they are, yeah. it's probably a bot or something, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> they're they're superhuman. Yeah, right click or that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that uh, that reminds me of the the similar issue that we have there with uh, MP3s. You know what? This brings me to my next question, where mm -hmm. 
even if you do all the right optimization for images, sometimes yeah. it's just a big image, especially if you're trying to load something that's very, very high quality, that's mm -hmm. a very big image for a big mm -hmm. screen. What can you do to change the perceived load time? Because that could even be more important than the actual load time, right? Mm -hmm. if, even mm -hmm. if the, the page is kind of slow to load, if things are popping up, when the user expects them to pop up, then yeah. they think it's fast. And then you can load all the slow stuff later and that's fine. How, how does Imagex do that or how can you do that on your website? So it really depends on, really depends on the scenario, right? Uh, if you're loading like extremely high resolution images into like a, a light box, right? Uh, you, there's probably going to be a, a navigation step immediately before that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so basically, when you're showing that thumbnail, right, you want to make sure that you're just showing a 200 by 200 thumbnail and not loading the entire image yeah. into the high resolution image into that container. And you'll you'll know what that looks like because it'll it'll look like 1996 all over again, where like the image just like slowly like scans in <laughs> top to bottom, and you're like, that's a they just put a five meg image into a little tiny container there, uh, just so they didn't have to make a second web request, um, which might be the right thing for them, but uh, Pro probably not. It's probably mm. not the right. Um, so it, it it really depends on the on the scenario. It depends on the user experience that you're going for. What uh, uh, what the requirements of of your end users are. Um, but Imagex is I like to think of as a very simple but extremely flexible system. So I I'm, I feel confident saying that no matter what it is you're trying to do, we can help you accomplish that. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is uh, I've seen a few websites do this. Pinterest is an example. I mm -hmm. think Medium also does this where they load, either they load the color of the image into yep. the container where the image is going to fit. Yep. And it's it's the color that matches or that's the most present in the image itself. Or mm -hmm. it loads a very, very pixelated image of the version or a version of the image where you don't mm -hmm. see any forms at all. You just see the colors. You see there's going to be an image there. And then boom, once it's done loading, instead of seeing that 1996 <laughs> style uh, yeah. loading, you see it pop up right away and it's not a big strain on your eyes because yep. your eyes are already seeing the colors in place. Uh, I'm pretty sure Imagex does that, right? I've seen, I've seen it on the website, I think, or something similar to that, right? Yeah, yeah. So we can, we can enable that experience uh, yeah. to happen, right? So we, there are two ways to do that with Imagex. We have, a, we have a pixelate parameter. So if you crank that up really high, okay. you'll get an image that's just like kind of like four, four squares, uh, basically like four huge pixels. Um, and just by the nature of that being a very simple image, that'll that'll load, uh, that'll come down the wire very quickly because the image will be no more than uh, a few bytes, right? Mm -hmm. um, especially if it's a ping. Um, and then uh, a lot of a lot of our customers also will actually also use uh, what's known as our JSON format. So ImageX can target all sorts of other different image formats, but we we can also target. Um, uh, JSON, which is basically just metadata about the image, and some of the metadata that we include, along with all the EXIF data, uh, is uh, uh, dominant color information. So you basically get a JSON payload back that says, "Here are the RGB values of the, you know, 16 most dominant colors in this image. Uh, do what you want with these values. Uh, like use some JavaScript to use that uh, uh, set like a CSS or a background color on the container." Uh, while you're waiting for the rest of the image to load, uh, you could even define entire layout images or uh, sorry colors depending on that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. And so if you actually and uh, like like any good service, we we dog food this quite a bit. So if you go to imagex.com and scroll down, there's like a little demo area, and you'll notice kind of the background has a the background of a certain section has a gradient on it. The mm -hmm. colors of those gradients are determined by the dominant colors in whatever image you're looking at. So if you cycle mm -hmm. cycle through that little uh, carousel there. Uh, those gradients will change. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you know what? I think there's obviously there's going to be more to image optimizations that uh, gets into more nitty gritty details that we probably don't have time for. Uh, can you think of anything else you'd like to talk about before we move on to uh, a few other questions? Or is that pretty much it? Um, probably keep, keep an eye on our blog. Uh, we write a lot about this stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. if you can't tell, this is basically the only thing we think about all day. Um, <laughs> uh, and and we're, always, we're always trying to be kind of at the, at the leading edge of, of what's coming up next and then offering ways to opt into that experience like client mm -hmm. hints, automatic content negotiation, um, and uh, all, sorts of other, all sorts of other stuff. So our blog, blog.imagex.com, is, is the best place to look for that. 
All right, sounds good. Okay, then let's move on. I've got a few more questions for you, and these aren't really uh, specific to image optimization. They're more questions I'm interested in knowing about. One of them is uh, related to the data center. And in that blog mm -hmm. post I mentioned earlier about implementing implementing the Mac servers is mm -hmm. uh, you called it the rapid deployment in a data center. And mm -hmm. I think you guys said that you were one of the first to use this kind of technique in data centers. But what does that mean? What is rapid deployment? Uh, ooh, this might have been slightly before my time at Imagix, okay. but um, uh, basically what that means is we can we can build racks that are ready to go to just wheel into the data center, uh, provided that's okay with our contract there. Um, uh, so you basically build the uh, build the racks and the cabinets, uh, and then just move those into a data center. Basically, <laughs> screw uh, screw them into the ground, plug in the cords, and then turn it on. Right. That that is always the if you look at any large company, you need that level of, uh, uh, I guess, like just swappability and scaling. Um, so every everything in Imagex is set up to be horizontal, horizontal, horizontally scalable, uh, so that if we do need more capacity in a specific uh, uh, at, at a specific at a specific application layer, we're able to just basically buy more buy more hardware um, and turn it on. Didn't you have to create your own racks for these servers because they didn't have anything that actually worked for uh, for them in the data center? Yeah, so we uh, we famously rack uh, Mac Minis and uh, Mac Pros, um, <laughs> both of which are very rarely seen in uh, in any sort of uh, server environment. Um, but again, like I like I said earlier in the interview, it's one of the most cost effective ways to do what we do. Um, so we did partner with a company called RackLive to design a custom-built uh, 40, I believe it's the it's a 46U uh, rack uh, that fits uh, four trash can Mac Pros on their side. Um, <laughs> trash can <laughs> Mac Pros. <laughs> yeah, 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 and it's and it's a it's a very <laughs> a very heavy rack, but uh, yeah. it works well. Uh, and a lot of people online. Uh, we'll always say like, "There's no way that makes any sense at all." Uh, <laughs> but it actually works. It actually works very well. Like airflow is not a problem. Uh, power draw is not an issue. Uh, these uh, the like the hardware of the Max is actually very very well designed, mm -hmm. um, and so it's able to even work inside of a inside of a server environment. There, they kind of look like R two D two without the legs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or trash can that works too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the, the the folks at uh, at the Apple Store knows pretty well. By now. <laughs> What's the development process at Imagex like? Uh, let's say I want to create a new um, SDK or library mm -hmm. for another language. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you guys handle that? So it uh, it it uh, as always depends on depends on the product and depends on where it fits in. Uh, generally, as a company, though, we we embrace uh, GitHub Flow, uh, which is, uh, uh, I guess, a, a subset or or an evolution of um, of feature based development, where every every feature gets its own branch, uh, and then uh, as things are completed, they get merged back into master. Uh, so this is specifically relating to the version control mm -hmm. aspect of it. Uh, everything gets merged back into master. Then master is basically uh, can be deployed at any time. It's safe to be deployed at any time. Uh, uh, deploy should be frictionless, uh, painless, and safe. So you can just run forty deploys a day if you want to, um, uh, and that anyone anyone in the company should be able to deploy any any piece of software if they have to. Um, those are kind of the goals that we strive towards. Every product is slightly different, and as you move away from the things that look like traditional web applications, you can't exactly just uh, deploy 40 times a day to uh, hundreds of different servers, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, because then you have to start dealing with like, okay, if, if the deploy fails on one, what does that mean <laughs> for like the deploy in aggregate? Yeah. Does that mean the entire deploy fails, or do we move that machine out of rotation? Uh, but for the most part, like that, those are the practices that we that we uh, try to adhere to. Uh, also, big on continuous integration, mm -hmm. uh, and then we like to use kind of like code coverage as a yardstick to how protected we are. You know, tests are never aren't going to save your ass a hundred percent of the time, right? Uh, but they will give you some confidence uh, in your ability to to ship code. Right. Um, Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Definitely kind of just basically 
a lot of what we do is just protecting ourselves from ourselves. Yeah, and it like, gets and it, <laughs> right. It gets rid of that fear where uh, you know maybe somebody's new at the company and they are going to deploy and they're like, well, what if I deploy something that takes everything down? Yep. Uh, that's not something good to have. But when you do have the the validation, hey, this code checks out against mm-hmm. our checks, uh, then that definitely makes it more enjoyable to to deploy. So, what about hiring? What do mm-hmm. you or what does Imagex as a company look for when hiring, uh, let's say, developers? Uh, yeah, so it, it, it again, like, depend, it depends on the position, right? Like, if yeah. you're working on our, on our imaging stack, you should probably know <laughs> a thing or two about, about imaging. Uh, when we're hiring kind of just, like, general purpose developers, though, uh, obviously, open source contributions make, uh, uh, make a world of difference just because if you're contributing to open source, and these days it, it means basically, like, are you, are you working on projects on GitHub? Uh, yeah. It's very easy for us to tell uh, uh, your working style. How do you uh, uh, how do you conduct yourself online? How do you have conversations? Importantly, like how do you how do you disagree with someone and try to make your case? That's a very difficult thing to do, um, uh, and difficult thing to do professionally, right? Yeah. Um, so, and GitHub is just such an amazing proxy for all of that stuff. Uh, uh, so, I would say we we look at. For for most of our engineering positions, we will look at GitHub contributions where uh, where appropriate, mm-hmm. um, and then it's a pretty pretty standard uh, hiring process. After that, we don't do any uh, there aren't any like particular hacks that we do. It's like, well, do we do we get along with this person? Are they smart? Uh, uh, can they can they reason about what they work on? Can they describe what they do? Um, and can they succinctly describe what they do? Mm-hmm. Um, and then, like, when they give us references, what are the people who have worked with these people before? Uh, yeah. What do they think about them? Right? Um, it's a it's a pretty I, I would say a pretty simple hiring process. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Some of those GitHub issue uh, or issues mm-hmm. get really heated sometimes. I mean, if you don't get the the feature you want or yeah. it's not solved fast enough, or you see some some pretty awful stuff on there sometimes. Uh, I guess that gives you a good idea of how they're going to work, and especially in a stressful environment. Yeah, yeah <laughs> probably well, a pretty good way. Yeah, our, our environment isn't particularly stressful, right? Like, like I mean, obviously the system needs to stay online one hundred percent of the time, yeah. so there's a, a certain level of stress that uh, uh, that that assumes. But uh, yeah, there's no there's no one like cracking. Uh, I guess I would be cracking the whip. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, we don't crack the whip too hard to the point where it's uh, where it is uncomfortable to to come into work every day, right? Sure. Um, yeah, and the same with uh, the hiring question that I, I like to ask. Uh, I don't get to ask it every every interview, but I do like to ask it just to see the different styles. And <laughs> when I was interviewing David, I ended up writing a Medium post about it yeah. um, that got quite a bit of attention. Actually, my most popular right, post yeah. to date. Yeah, uh, a lot of people liked it, and then a lot of people attacked me. Mm-hmm. And David for it. Uh, it's a, it's just a very heated debate. I mean, they yeah. will insult you. They'll tell you you're completely wrong. Yeah. Um, same thing with GitHub issues. It just happens. But uh, you know what? I guess that means that people really care about the stuff they're working on. Yeah, um, exactly. And about progressing forward. So, hey, yeah. sometimes passion is okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> as long yeah, as it's not taken too far. Yeah. Well, and that, and that guy has like like the passion level on <laughs> on lockdown. I would say. So. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so I guess you could say that. <laughs> he's got a monopoly on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Kelly. I mean, uh, the, I'm out of questions here. Uh, I'm sure we could be talking about this all day. This is really interesting stuff. And like I said at the beginning, who doesn't have images? I mean, uh, sure, there are a few sites that don't have images, but they're everywhere uh, from just funny GIFs to explaining how things work to showing the product images like uh, we've been saying for for hundreds, if not thousands of years are Mm -hmm. worth uh, thousands of words. So, um, you know, optimizing them, having them go faster or load faster is incredibly important. So I really appreciate you taking the time to not only explain how ImageX works behind the scenes, but also giving us some actionable items uh, to optimize images. So uh, I would say, um, and, and give me your input on this, but people who have listened through this entire interview, what do you think they should do right after this interview? Do you think they should look at their images and how they could cache them or optimize them? What do you think about that? Uh, I mean, they should definitely do. If they're thinking about this, they should definitely do an audit on what their what yeah. their current setup is, and, and uh, really look at yeah, like are the sizes they're serving correct? Are things in front of a CDN? And then are you serving the correct format? Right. Yeah. 
Um, cool. Those are where the biggest wins can come from. Um, and then, yeah, like image, images are kind of a, like a, an elephant in the room uh, in a lot of ways. They're, they make up 65% of an average web page's load wow. time, but they're also... Like it's it's weird that Imagex is one of the few companies that does what we do, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, you would think there would be like hundreds of companies worrying about uh, mm -hmm. optimizing images on the page just because they make up so much, such such a large percentage of the data. Uh, yeah, sixty five percent is quite a bit. I guess it shouldn't surprise me really, but yeah. uh, when you hear it that that way, it is a uh, pretty shows you how important it is, and that's why I'm really thankful to have you on the show. Uh, if people want to follow up with you, how do you recommend they do that? Uh, you can just send me an email, kelly at imagex dot com. Uh, if I don't know the answer to that, I can always forward you on to one of my one of the members of my team that does. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, that's that's probably the best best place if you want to see what we do. Just imagex dot com or our blog. Uh, write about all this stuff quite a bit. Yeah, great, great. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Please leave a, leave a comment to thank Kelly for his time and for helping us uh, make our pages faster and also <laughs> if you've enjoyed this interview or any other interviews in the past please do me a big favor and uh, help share it you never know this could help other developers around the world improve their apps and also um, I hear that rating on iTunes is pretty important and I haven't really been doing that or asking people to help me with that so uh, please if you have just a, a minute or two please consider giving me a, a rating on iTunes and if, if it's not a five-star rating then just send me an email, um, chris at scalarycode.com, and let me know why. I mean, you know, it's fine if you want to put that on there, no problem, but I want to improve this show as much as possible, so please give me some feedback. Thank you so much, guys, and I hope you have a great day. Take care. Until next time. Thanks, Christoph.